space exploration, global leadership, carbon-free energy, transformative healthcare, innovation, and technology. These all have one thing in common, nuclear science. The Nuclear Network series is a way for all of us to learn and explore how nuclear science makes our lives better. Hi, I'm Ashley Cheney, and I'm joined by Gabriella and Mickey in the Kids' Corner. And we'll be with you on this educational adventure. On today's episode, number two of three, we'll focus on two exciting topics, carbon-free energy and transformative healthcare. You're probably wondering how these two things connect to nuclear science, and that's exactly what we'll explain to you in the next half hour. Plus, Dr. Mike Short from MIT is going to show us a science experiment that you might be able to do at home and that you can't find anywhere else. Have you ever seen a city skyline with a brown haze hanging over it? Or tried to look at the mountains, but they were blocked by smog? You may already know that what you're looking at is pollution. Many leaders around the world want to reduce pollution and improve our air quality. For a long time, the main way humans made most of our electricity was burning natural resources. And the smoke from that burning put pollution in the air, mainly carbon. But when we figured out how to split atoms to create heat and then ultimately make electricity, when we started producing nuclear energy, that changed the game. Today, 20% of all the electricity in the United States comes from nuclear power plants. But get this, when it comes to clean, carbon-free electricity, nuclear makes up about 55% of the clean energy in our country. Let's take a closer look at how it all works. Nuclear power plants generate electricity from nuclear fission that happens inside a reactor. In the United States, there are two common commercial nuclear reactor designs. One is the boiling water reactor. The other is a pressurized water reactor. The nuclear science behind the two is pretty similar. So for time's sake, let's take a look inside a pressurized water reactor. Nuclear fission happens when a thermal neutron slams into the nucleus of a uranium atom and divides it. Think of it this way, fission is division. When the division happens, a tremendous amount of energy is released. That energy heats up the water surrounding the atoms, and the water becomes super hot. This heated reactor water travels through a pipe from the reactor to a steam generator, where cooler water becomes steam. The steam then spins huge turbines like a pinwheel and ultimately drives the generator to make electricity. That electricity travels from the nuclear plants across power lines and into our cities, energizing things like streetlights, sports stadiums, and even our cell phones. We've just learned how power plants make nuclear energy. And it takes a lot of highly educated, highly trained professionals to get that electricity into our homes. An average nuclear power plant generates one gigawatt of electricity annually. The Department of Energy translates exactly how much that is. Now we have a better handle on nuclear power, how it's made, how it compares to other clean sources, and why it's so important to keeping our skies blue. Because we've learned all that, let's take a look inside the spot that has made more clean energy than any other power plant for roughly 30 years in a row, Palo Verde Generating Station in Arizona. Welcome to the Palo Verde Generating Station. My name is Maria Lacal. I'm the Chief Nuclear Officer here. And my job primarily is to run the nation's largest carbon-free energy producer. So I, along with many nuclear professionals, operate this plant safely and reliably, 24-7, 365 days a year. And we're really excited for you to be here. Nuclear power is clean, safe, reliable, and actually pretty big. It's got a lot of big pumps and valves and other components and some really cool technology that I think you'll find super interesting. So I'm really excited for you to come and take a tour, see what this is all about, and enjoy the Palo Verde Generating Station. 
Palo Verde is located near Phoenix, Arizona, in the Sonoran Desert. Palo Verde has three reactors. The reactors are inside containment domes. These structures are over 100 feet tall. If the nuclear reactor is the engine, then the uranium pellets, the size of the tip of your finger, are the fuel that powers it. At Palo Verde, we have millions of pellets inside the reactor cores. When the fuel is in the core, the fission process happens when atoms split. This process heats up the water around the fuel to temperatures five times higher than the hottest day in the desert. So, how do we cool an engine that big in the middle of the desert? It's actually cooled by recycled wastewater because Palo Verde is the only nuclear power plant in the world not located on a body of water. Outside the reactor, the turbine building houses the important equipment that ultimately creates electricity. Gigantic turbines and a generator work together to convert mechanical energy to electrical energy. The electricity is taken from our site to power lines and then put out to homes and businesses across the entire Southwest. As you can see, it takes a lot of large specialized equipment and technology to turn nuclear fuel into electricity. Inside our control rooms, we have walls of screens, levers, gauges, and buttons, all corresponding to specific parts of the plant. Our reactor operators actually receive more training than airline pilots or surgeons. I hope you've enjoyed your virtual tour of Palo Verde today and learned a lot of interesting facts along the way. The next time you turn on your light switch or plug in your tablet, clean and carbon-free nuclear power might have produced the electricity to help power your world. From the largest clean producer of electricity in one spot today to the king of clean power tomorrow, Southern Company has been building two new nuclear units in Georgia to add to the two that are already there. This construction marks a huge milestone in the U.S., as these two plants are the first built from the ground up in our country in the last three decades. Let's take a closer look. Hi, I'm Jennifer Bateau. I'm a system engineer, and I'm here near Augusta, Georgia, where Georgia Power and Southern Nuclear are building the future of nuclear energy at Plant Vogel. The progress made here at Vogel 3 and 4 is the result of thousands of workers and years of planning, design, and construction. Once complete and combined with the current operating units at Vogel 1 and 2, this site will be the largest and only four-unit nuclear electric generating facility in the U.S. Ultimately, the facility will provide over one million homes and businesses with carbon-free electricity. The new units have many of the same features as existing plants with concrete and steel structures that house the nuclear reactors, and turbine buildings where electricity is generated. The two cooling towers are nearly 600 feet tall, making them the 12th highest structures in the state of Georgia. They'll also have several advancements that help the unit safely produce electricity more reliably and efficiently. It's been exciting to be part of a construction project of this size and importance. We've used crane lifts to place plant components weighing over 1,000 tons. That's the equivalent to at least two jumbo jets in weight. And we've placed enough concrete to build a sidewalk from Miami to Seattle. The 23,000 tons of structural steel required for Vogel 3 and 4 is enough to build 25,000 automobiles. Why does it take so much steel, concrete, and so many people? Well, these units are expected to provide a tremendous amount of electricity for up to 80 years, and the construction standards are rigorous. Once the units are operational, the four units at Plant Vogel will be the largest source of carbon-free electricity in the U.S. That's equivalent to removing two million cars from the roads each year. The new units we're building here at Plant Vogel are the future of nuclear energy. We've just learned about the largest generating nuclear power plant of today. And we saw what tomorrow's king of clean energy generation looks like being built. But sometimes, companies operate or manage more than one nuclear generating facility. This is called a fleet of nuclear reactors, and it's used to power cities in various regions of the country. Two of the largest fleets are Exelon and Entergy.
These companies operate nuclear reactors in the eastern half of America. Exelon is the largest U.S. fleet with 21 reactors at 12 facilities in four states. Entergy operates or provides management services for eight reactors at seven facilities in five states. And Southern Company has six reactors at three facilities in two states. Having this many nuclear reactors allows these companies to deliver a tremendous amount of clean energy to their customers around the clock since nuclear energy is produced 24-7. In total, these fleets include 22 nuclear generating facilities, which make up nearly half of the nuclear generating facilities in the U.S. Still to come on this episode of Nuclear Network, we'll hear from the woman in charge when it comes to the nuclear energy industry. Plus, find out how nuclear works with doctors to detect diseases earlier than ever before. And our resident nuclear doctor, Dr. Mike Short, will be teaching us why fireworks burn different colors and how you can detect what materials are lighting up the sky. But first, let's head over to the kids' corner with Gabriella and Mickey for our first Did You Know of the day. What's up, guys? Thanks, Ashley. Mickey, one thing most people don't know is that uranium in nuclear reactors comes in the form of ceramic fuel pellets with millions inside each reactor. And those pellets are small in size. How much energy does a uranium pellet the size of a gummy bear produce? We'll tell you after a quick break. The essence of engineering is to use known technologies in new ways to solve problems and answer questions. To me, the MIT Nuclear Reactor Lab really is kind of the beginnings of a lot of real world research. You can calculate things and you can put them on paper, but you need to stick them in a reactor to see what they're gonna do, and this is the first place where that can get done. The energy in one nuclear fuel pellet is equal to one ton of coal, 17,000 cubic feet of natural gas, or three barrels of oil. That's a lot of power in one tiny pellet. And we're in luck today because we're about to talk to a lady who knows a thing or two about those pellets. Joining us now is Maria Korznik, President and Chief Executive Officer at the Nuclear Energy Institute in Washington, D.C. Mrs. Korznik, thank you for joining us. It's great to be here. Maria, what exactly is the Nuclear Energy Institute? Everything we do is really about making sure that people here in the United States and around the world have access to clean, reliable energy. We can protect the environment and make sure that we have the ability to cook our food, cook our food do our schoolwork, and even play for it. Being the president and chief executive officer of NEI sounds like a really big role. What does a typical workday look like for you? The biggest part of my job is to talk to audiences about how important nuclear is to society. For example, we produce 55% of America's carbon-free energy. Nuclear energy does not produce air pollution. So that's very important to the environment and combating climate change. What's your favorite part of your job at the Nuclear Energy Institute? Well, I'm really passionate about nuclear energy. 
Uh, I know how important that nuclear carbon-free energy is to our future, and I really enjoy making a difference. So when I hear about people like those watching this interview, learning more about nuclear energy, that's what gets me really excited. Perhaps one of the things I like the most is to talk about all the new technologies being developed. Science and technology are so interesting to me. So, Miss Maria, what did you study and what career experiences did you have to get you to that position? Well, I love math and science. Um, I really like how math and science can help you figure out problems and find solutions. So I took a lot of math and science classes in school. When I was in college, I studied engineering. And I started my career at a power plant. I worked in operations, which makes sure that the plant was running safely. Um, eventually, I was in the control room. So I sat in front of all sorts of screens and dials and made sure that the plant was operating well and that the power was getting to the community. So most of my study and career was in the field of nuclear engineering, figuring yeah. out how things work. So if you like science and math, you should think about engineering when you get to college. That is a lot of dedication to nuclear science. We learned a lot about nuclear energy today, and it seems so important to keep the lights on and the air clean in America. What do you love the most about nuclear energy? Perhaps most importantly, nuclear provides electricity without harming the environment. And that's what I love about nuclear, our ability to make people's lives better while protecting the environment. It sounds like nuclear energy is so great. But we learned today that only two new plants are being built in the United States. Why not more? You know, that's a great question. There are lots of reasons. One is that our current nuclear plants are very large. They produce a lot of power. And luckily in the United States, we've done a great job to become really energy efficient with energy efficient appliances like refrigerators and your air conditioning. And so the result is we don't always need the large amounts of power that come from a large reactor. And at the same token, people are now really starting to look at nuclear power again because there's a lot of attention on the environment. And that means that people are starting to care about where their electricity comes from. There's much more interest in nuclear because it's good for the environment. So if you want nuclear power but don't need huge reactors, then you need a new solution. And in our industry right now, we're solving that problem. And this is why some of the new types of nuclear plants are smaller and less expensive to build. And those will be the plants that we're going to be building probably around the time that you're in college. If there was one thing that you wanted kids to know about nuclear energy, what would it be? Well, we're facing all sorts of problems today because the, ch the climate is changing. You may have heard about the wildfires in California and Oregon or that there's more hurricanes reaching the United States. Well, nuclear energy is part of the solution that can help make things better. If you're interested in the environment, whether it's protecting endangered species or making Earth a safer planet, or if you're just interested in submarines or space travel, I just encourage you to continue to learn more about nuclear energy because it has the power to change our lives. And for those of you interested in science and math, keep at it. I've had a wonderful career in nuclear energy, and I would like to one day work with each of you to bring a clean, carbon-free energy to the world. Okay, Miss Maria, it's time for our lightning round, where we get to know you a little better. You ready? What is your favorite food? Chocolate chip cookies. If you could have a superpower, what would it be and why? Well, I think I'd love to be able to fly, and that way I could travel anywhere I wanted to, whenever I wanted to go there. What did you want to be when you were a kid? A medical doctor. What is your favorite sports team or hobby outside of work? Well, I like to watch baseball. Um, I'm a Washington Nationals fan, and I did play on our softball team here at work. Uh, but uh, personally, I really love to play golf. What is one piece of advice you would give a student interested in nuclear science? Go for it. Be excited about it. We're on the verge of nuclear energy expanding around the world, and this is a great time to think about how you can bring electricity to people and help protect the planet. 
Thank you so much, Maria. It's awesome to learn about all you and your team are doing for the nuclear industry. Now let's head back to Ashley for more on what's coming up and another Did You Know? Thanks, you guys. Great job talking to Maria. Still to come on this episode of The Nuclear Network, we'll dive into what we call transformative healthcare and find out how nuclear medicine works as a detective when it comes to digging deep inside our bodies to find those tricky diseases. Plus, Mickey and Gabriella will talk to Dr. Aaron Grady about the field of nuclear medicine. And Dr. Mike Short explains how fireworks have actual individual colors as they light up the sky. But first, which state has the most operating commercial nuclear reactors? The answer, when we return. Energy is like the human spirit. Transformative and resilient. For over 100 years, we've embraced change and innovation to deliver the energy you count on, to serve our customers and communities no matter what. Because we believe resilient people make resilience possible. By working together, we can build a better future. Southern Company. Nuclear power is very important in meeting Intergy's carbon reduction goals. Nuclear power is safe, it's reliable, it's carbon free, and it's affordable. But that's what makes it a great source of energy for our state and our nation. Nuclear power can produce electricity all day long and all night long, sustainably, reliably, and constantly. So it's gonna be supplying energy for us in a clean way, and that's what customers want. What if I told you the company leading America to a clean energy future produces electricity through wind, solar, hydro, and 12 nuclear power plants across four states? At Exelon Generation, we are not only the nation's largest generator of carbon-free power, but we are leading the crucial transition to clean energy across the board. The state with the most operating nuclear reactors is Illinois, which has 11. The Department of Energy says Illinois receives more than 50% of its energy from nuclear power plants. So far, we've learned about nuclear energy on this show. And on the first episode of Nuclear Network, we learned about science in space and on the seven seas in the U.S. Navy. But did you know that nuclear science helps doctors see inside our bodies when they need more information? Like whether or not we have something going on that they might need to treat, like an issue with one of our organs. To learn more about how this works and to see a little of the science behind nuclear medicine and images, let's meet some new characters and check out this animated story. Normally when you are sick, you go see the doctor. After looking at you and listening to your body, the doctor might give you medicine to help you feel better. But sometimes your sickness is really tricky, and the doctor needs more information to help you. They need to take a look inside of your body to see your organs and understand what's making you sick. Normal cameras can't see the inside of the human body, but don't worry. There are special cameras that can. And that's where nuclear science helps. Here's how. In order to take a special picture, we need a special substance, a radio pharmaceutical called a tracer, which has a very tiny dose of radiation. And while that sounds scary, it's really not. Here's why. Tracers are radioactive products that come mostly from nuclear reactors. Yes, like the reactors in nuclear power plants that create electricity. Once the tracer is given, it goes to a specific part of your body, where the radioactivity lights up an organ to help the special camera to take a picture of it. These pictures, called nuclear imaging, let the nuclear medicine doctor see how your organs are working and can be used to detect things like heart disease, brain disease, and cancer. And guess what? Once the tracer has done its job, it disappears from your body pretty quickly, most of the time in just a few hours or so. Of course, there are other ways to detect some of these diseases, but nuclear imaging can help detect the sickness faster, which means you can get treatment to feel better sooner. Wow, we just learned a ton about radiopharmaceuticals and how they help doctors take pictures they wouldn't be able to get. Now, let's learn even more about nuclear medicine from our Kids' Corner. Thanks, Ashley. 
That video was super interesting. And you're right, we learned a lot about tracers and nuclear medicine as a whole. For even more on the subject, we are now joined by our good friend, Dr. Aaron Grady from Emory University in Atlanta. Dr. Grady, thanks for joining us. How are you doing today? Doing great. How are you guys? We're good. We're good. We just saw a really cool video that taught us about nuclear medicine. So wait, can nuclear medicine really help special cameras see inside our bodies and take pictures? Yes. How cool is that? The pictures are all about tracing body function. We can tell if the body function is normal or abnormal. Special cameras called gamma cameras are able to see gamma rays coming outside of patients. The, the gamma rays basically are packets of energy that have no mass, and the gamma camera can be set up to detect different levels of energy. Wow, so what else can nuclear medicine do? Yeah, nuclear medicine can also treat patients with both cancer or non-cancer problems. So we use different um, isotopes that have mass to treat patients. Those would be um, beta particles or alpha particles. Do a lot of patients receive nuclear medicine? Yes, about 15 million imaging studies are done every year in the United States, and about 15 to 20 percent of patients that are in the hospital will have a nuclear medicine study as part of their diagnostic workup. Nuclear medicine sounds so interesting. Did you always know you wanted to be a doctor? And what got you interested in nuclear medicine? Oh, great question. So nuclear medicine um, is interesting. I agree. Uh, and I wanted to be a doctor since um, I was in second grade. I read the biography of Elizabeth Blackwell at that time, and that was the first woman doctor. And ever since then, I was thinking, wow, being a doctor would be super cool. What do you love the most about your job? There's so much to love. <laughs> I think I love the patients the most. Um, they're always a lot of fun uh, to deal with. And um, I also enjoy uh, teaching. Uh, teaching is one of my major passions. Uh, and um, I really love the people I get to work with, too. My um, co-doctors uh, and uh, my colleagues who are technologists or nurse navigators and other people. It's a great team. Okay. So what advice would you give to a kid who wants to become a doctor, and especially a nuclear doctor? Well, I think every kid needs to find that spark, that um, thing that creates curiosity for them, that makes them want to work harder. And whatever that is, um, my advice is to stick with it, have fun, and never give up. This has been so fun talking to you and learning even more about nuclear medicine. If there was one last thing that you wanted kids to know about nuclear medicine, what would it be? You know, radiation is not like you see in science fiction, you know, movies. Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot more boring than that. Um, so basically, we have a, a few things like time and distance that really make a big difference to keep us safe from radiation. It's time for our lightning round, where we get to know you a little better. You ready? Yep, I'm ready. Here we go. What is your favorite food? I love fruits and vegetables. If I had to pick one, it would be the blueberry because it's an antioxidant powerhouse. If you could have a superpower, what would it be and why? I would pick invulnerability because that would be a great thing to have right now um, when we have so much stress and, and uh, uh, crazy things happening like COVID. That was a good answer. What did you want to be when you were a kid? When I was a kid, I wanted to be a lot of different things. A veterinarian for a while, but that didn't work out because I had a lot of allergies. Um, I thought about being a secret agent at one point, but really doctor is what, um, from second grade onward, I was pretty set on. What is your favorite sports team or hobby outside of work? Well, we root for all of the home teams in Atlanta, um, but uh, my, my favorite hobby outside of work is probably biking and spending time with family. What is one piece of advice you would give a student interested in nuclear science? Well, I think the piece of advice, no matter what you're interested in, would be don't give up. Stick with it. Dr. Grady, thanks for spending some time with us. Thank you. Thank you. Gabriella, it's becoming transparent you're thoroughly enjoying these interviews. I can see through that tough exterior to your excitement. I think you're hinting at x-ray vision, Mickey. And speaking of x-rays... For all of you at home, where and when was the first x-ray discovered? 
As the nation's largest clean air energy producer, Palo Verde Generating Station is at the forefront of meeting today's electricity needs and innovating for a sustainable energy future. We are proud to champion nuclear energy as a dependable and vital source of power to help meet long-term energy goals. In the Southwest, the future of nuclear energy is safe, plentiful, and carbon-free. Palo Verde, generation for generations. General Atomics has long been at the forefront of the drive to fulfill the promise of fusion energy. GA built and operated a succession of pioneering fusion experiments culminating in the D3D National Fusion Facility, the site of numerous scientific breakthroughs. GA has proven itself a trusted technology supplier for the ITER International Fusion Experiment, fabricating the central solenoid, the most powerful of its magnet systems. GA will continue to provide leadership and scientific insight on the path to practical fusion energy. Welcome to the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History. Located in Albuquerque, New Mexico, this Smithsonian affiliate tells the story of the atomic age, from early developments to today's peaceful uses of nuclear technology. Nuclear has impacted so much of our culture, and we have some of the coolest objects. You won't want to miss our nine-acre outdoor exhibit area or our other amazing exhibits. We hope you stop by soon to learn, think, imagine, and draw your own conclusions. A German professor discovered X-ray imaging in 1895. Hey everyone, welcome to Science Shorts. I'm Mike Short from MIT's Department of Nuclear Science and Engineering, and today we're going to be lighting stuff on fire. I'm going to explain how fireworks work, not the exploding part, but the colorful part that actually makes them fireworks. So for this demo, the first thing you're going to want is safety goggles. For those of you like me who wear glasses, they are not a substitute for safety goggles because things can slip in the side and make you go blind. Some of these things you're going to be able to do at home under the watchful eye of one of your parents or guardians. Some of them are more dangerous, and I'm going to be using gloves for these. You'll have to ask your science teacher if you can get a hold of them. Now these three right here, I've got sodium chloride, better known as table salt. You can get that from the grocery store. Potassium chloride, better known as low sodium salt. For folks that have high blood pressure, this is the stuff they use when they want to taste something nice without getting too much sodium. And calcium chloride, a food additive that's used to help certain things gel. Now the four I've got over here are also tin, lithium, copper, and strontium chloride. These are more toxic, and these are the ones you'd have to deal with with your science teacher. I've also got a fire extinguisher in case things go south. And I've got a source of fire because why would we be here if I didn't? Finally, I've got a plan to clean up my chemical mess. I have a clean waste bottle and a couple of tags to help me know what this waste is so that I can clean this up effectively. Now what you'll need is just a cup of warm water because warm water helps things dissolve better. The various chemicals I've got here, a few pieces of glassware. Now I brought some from my lab, but you can use glasses or cups from your home and a bunch of wooden coffee stirs. The coffee stirs do two things. One, they help you stir and dissolve these powders so that they form a clear solution. And two, you're gonna hold them in front of the fire so you don't have to dip your finger in and get a little toasty this way. So I've already put water in five of these and I want you to watch what happens when I add water to this, the strontium chloride. Notice it gets a little cloudy. I'm just gonna swish that around, get it nice and dissolved. And now I've got my copper compound. Oh, that's a little bit of a surprise. It turned blue. So now I'll get these coffee stirs in there, get them soaking up all that nice chemical goodness, fire up our fire, and let's see what they look like. Now I'm using a propane torch because the flame is almost invisible. So that way, whatever effect the chemical has, you're going to see it pretty well. Let's start off with sodium chloride. Watch carefully. Oh-ho! Bright, beautiful yellow flame. This is characteristic of sodium compounds. This is what I'm doing right now is called a flame test. If you don't know what metals are in a compound, you just light them on fire and see what color shoots out. Okay, enough for the sodium chloride. Let's try potassium chloride. 
Beautiful dark purple color. That's quite typical of potassium chloride. Notice also it's not as bright. You need a lot stronger or more potassium compounds to get that nice purple color. And that's one of the reasons you don't see purple fireworks as much as you see the orange ones, because it's a little bit harder to make this color. Let's move on to calcium. Red, orange red. So if you want that deeper orange red that's got nothing to do with sodium, calcium's your bet. Now let's move on to tin. I actually have no idea what this one's gonna do because I grabbed it at the last minute. So we get a faint orange and blue at the same time. That's unexpected. Let's move on to something more expected. You might have seen this in some really nice fireworks. This is lithium chloride, red. Blood red lithium chloride. I'm gonna do that one again. I absolutely love this red color. You might not have known you could turn a flame this color, but well, here you are. On to copper. Anyone wanna take a wild guess what this is gonna be based on, well, the color of the solution? Think it's gonna be blue? You're wrong! It's green. So the color of the chemical doesn't necessarily tell you the color of the flame test. So let's do that again. I'll hold this up so you can see. Despite the fact that the chemical is blue, copper salts give off a beautiful green color. And finally, strontium chloride. This is one of the more toxic ones, so I'm not gonna put my face in it. But let's take a look. Redder than lithium, the brightest red I've ever seen. So using just nothing but fire and a little bit of uh, coffee technology, we're able to recreate the entire rainbow of fireworks in these simple chemicals. <laughs> anyway. So, I hope I've shown you a few things today. One of them is that flames can reveal chemistry. You can tell what sorts of metals are in things by lighting them on fire, and you can use this to your advantage to make beautiful colored fireworks. I'm not going to teach you how to make the exploding part. Let's just say you can look into that on your own if you feel so inclined. This is your friendly pyrotechnic professor signing off. I can honestly say I'll never watch a fireworks show in the same way. Who knew that different properties from different metals is what gives fireworks all those different colors? In this instance, different is definitely good. All right, thanks so much for taking today's nuclear network adventure with us. And thank you to the Nuclear Energy Institute, our other nuclear energy partners, Emory University, and Dr. Mike Short. For Mickey and Gabriella, I'm Ashley, and I hope to see you tomorrow on the last episode of the Nuclear Network, when we'll look at how innovation is changing the face of nuclear science, what's on the horizon when it comes to the reactors of the future, and we'll take a virtual tour of the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And from all of us at the Nuclear Network, more power to you.